So tonight we um, are kind of gathering to talk about social isolation, um, but I just wanted to take a second to kind of zoom out and like, why are we actually on this call and what, um, what are the things that have happened to get us to this point? So um, in 2019, uh, the Alliance conducted a listening campaign where we listened to the stories of 2000 people across Queensland. Um, we kind of heard the pressures that uh, existed in their daily lives um, and, you know, some of the things they care about, what, what is important to them to act on in public. In March, uh, we decided that uh, we discerned together, we had a discernment assembly um, where we decided that we were going to act on um, two main campaign areas. One is um, safe and connected communities and the other is real jobs for a real future, which really ties together jobs and climate. Uh, literally 48 hours later, uh, we went into lockdown and, um, you know, as we all have been living for the last few months, the COVID pandemic happened. Um, so we decided that rather than kind of charge on with the campaign plans that we had and develop the campaigns that we had, we developed uh, what's called a maroon print, because um, why would we have a blueprint in Queensland? Um, so the maroon print is a bit of a vision and some principles that will outline kind of what does civil society want and need um, in order to kind of have a healthy reconstruction um, post COVID. What do we think that the governments of, of Queensland should be doing um, in order to have a thriving society post COVID, post, post the health pandemic, the dem democratic crisis and the recession that we are starting to enter. Um, and so we kind of took that, that document that Maroon print to uh, the opposition leader Deb Frecklington and we're still negotiating with the Premier's office about uh, trying to take that to her as well. Um, but the next kind of piece of that is trying to actually make that more than a document, right? Like this needs to be a living thing. Um, we at the Alliance take a community organising approach, which means that we build power with people and with civil society and this needs to be something that all of you live and breathe and own. And so um, I guess the idea of these, these uh, civic academies um, is that we will bring in some experts who will um, tell us all the things that they think about and write about and read about every day um, so that we can then create more informed policy um, that kind of puts more detail on the, maroon, the policies outlined, sorry, the principles outlined in the maroon print. The first is to develop the technical and policy knowledge among Alliance leaders and within Alliance institutions. So uh, an understanding of, of policy in, in the, the area that we're looking at tonight around social isolation and then on the, on the following um, weeks. Um, the second is to build on our Marome print vision and principles for Queensland reconstruction. And the third is to increase um, the imagination and ambition um, that we have as civil society leaders around public policy. So changing our, our perspective on, on that. But now I'm going to hand over to David Kennedy to talk us through um, how, this, how this piece tonight fits in with civil society and democracy broadly. Thanks, Emily. Um, so um, my name's David. I'm the lead organiser for the Queensland Community Alliance and it's um, Great to be with everyone. Um, so tonight uh, and starting these civic academies is, is um, I think an exciting step in terms of our alliance and part of it goes um, back to some of the, the, the purpose and vision of the alliance. So I'm gonna step us through a couple of um, elements of how we see uh, the different players in public life. Um, and the role of civil society within that, and then lead us back into why um, our role as civil society leaders and, and particularly the, the role of these civic academies. Um, so we, in the Alliance, we talk about the um, public space and public, um, life having these three um, elements of market, um, government and civil society. 
Um, so we all buy and sell goods in, in the market. You know, many of us are employed in the market, but usually we'll be buy our groceries or our toothbrush um, in, in the market. Um, we all engage with uh, government and the state, um, not just the government, but the, the institutions of, of, of government, whether that's the police, whether that's um, schools um, and so on. And then civil society where um, all of us in the Alliance are also active in, which is the meaning making institutions, the voluntary places where people come together in relationships around shared values. And essentially we, we think that um, society works best when those three circles are um, roughly the same size and can therefore hold each other to account. So each of those circles has an important role to play in our society. Um, so the market has an important role. Um, the, the state has an important role. Civil society has an important role. But, but problems emerge when, um, when the market is dominant or where the state is dominant to, a, to an extent where it cannot be held to account. Um, and we, we see that the impact of that when um, as a community, we can't hold large corporations to account or we don't have the mechanisms to hold um, aspects of the government to account. And essentially over the last um, 40 or so years, we argue that instead of being three equal circles, that the situation has changed to the market being a really big circle. The government still being, government still being quite um, large, but seeing its role more about encouraging the development of the market and civil society going from being an equal sized circle that could hold the other two to account to being smaller um, and, and, and therefore less, um, less powerful. Um, but I think in the context of tonight and in the context of how we think about politics and how we think about democracy, it's important that we see all of this space as politics. So market, government and civil society are, are all how, part of how we imagine politics and how we, how we imagine democracy needing to function. So when we talk about democracy, we're obviously then not just talking about um, election time. Um, so I guess I'll come back to that point because tonight we will be talking a bunch about election time and through this series of civic academies, we will be talking a bunch about election time. But we want to put it in the context of of the wider things that we're trying to do. Um, and particularly what civil society brings is um, like the, the, these different circles have different cultures. Um, so the market has a culture that's around um, exchange and profit. Um, government and, has a, and the state has a, a culture that's around bureaucracy, um, that's around kind of being treated as a, like as a, as a, a um, by the bureaucratic state as a number, like think of the way that you're treated when you go to Centrelink, essentially, as, as, the, as the frame. And civil society, the culture of civil society is about relationships and it's about storytelling. It's the, the human being as the um, homo narrans, the ape that tells stories about itself. And so when we, when we think about transforming civil, uh, when we think about civil society transforming democracy, um, what we need to do is bring those values and practices in, of civil society um, to bear in our own organisations and in, and in the wider relationship between these. Now, that, that, can, be, um, that can be really hard to do. And um, in, two day, in our two-day training, we often look at this um, slide where we took where we see the way that the stories that we individually have about pressures that are on us if we experience ourselves over here as as victims or as clients or as rugged individuals who can overcome anything then when we individually enter the public sphere we tend to do that in a way that is 
reactive, it's angry and overwhelmed and people can easily get picked off. Um, but if we can see ourselves as connected individuals through mediating organizations, so whether that is the Rohingya Support Society or the Logan East Community Center or the Uniting Church in Queensland, you know, mediating organizations that stand between a really, the really big state or the really big market and, a, and, and the individual um, and engage us. When we have that, we can be coming in as connected people who are able to learn and be leaders and creators and, and positive actors. And our, our engagement with civil society, uh, with, with society, our engagement with the public sphere can be hopeful and powerful and proactive. And I guess what I want to draw out is that, like, that's what we're doing tonight. Um, um, when we're coming here in these civic academies, we are practicing this process of being connected individuals across really diverse organizations, being engaged civil society, um, and actually coming together and being learners and leaders and creators. Um, we've got, there's a long history of politics everywhere, but especially in this state of, um, you know, politicians who think that they'll decide and everyone else will kind of deal with that. You know, don't, don't you worry about that. Obviously being the, the classic, classic Joe peterson line, right? But we see it, we see it currently, like we see it with, um, you know, we currently have in the Alliance a, a situation where the Premier is saying, I'm not going to, I'm not going to meet with you. I'm not going to meet with, um, an organization representing more than 2 million Queenslanders who's got views about um, how our state should be reconstructed. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to do it right. And, and you guys respond. Um, and so it's actually a really important practice that we're coming together and learning ways to break that down, learning ways to engage each other and then engage politics, uh, you know, um, electoral politics and engage the market um, to break some of this down and be be hopeful and effective and proactive. So um, in these civic academies, then we, um, we want to think about seasons of democratic action. So around election time is a really key moment. Um, it's important that we're active in ways that focus on the election and then focus on getting specific commitments. Um, but that's not to the exclusion of the long, slow work of building relationships, of um, creating what, new ways of doing things, you know, of doing things like our groups in Stafford and Chermside and Mount Gravatt and Mogul are doing, having conversations with their neighbours and, and working out how to, how to respond. Um, so, this, these civic academies are supposed to equip us to do both of those things. They're supposed to equip us to have a, enough knowledge about this area of social isolation and next week community centers and then the energy transition and then um, jobs based stimulus. Equip us with enough information that we can have real negotiations with political leaders in the lead up to the election because it is that season of election time. Um, in our democratic cycle. But also these civic academies should equip us to do that long, slow relational work, to be able to um, connect, you know, in new ways across diverse um, constituencies and to see diversity and those type of relationships as a, a, as a strength within our, in our common life. So, um, I hope that makes sense. We, um, we, we have this broad vision around politics and democracy being much larger than just elections. We want to transform all of that with the values that we bring as civil society people and the focus on relationships that we bring. Um, we need to do that in ways that help us learn new habits. And, um, and these, these civic academies should equip us both for the short term 
um, really fast and pointy stuff around particular asks before the election, but also to do the long, slow um, work of, of um, building relationships and, and transforming our culture. Thanks, Devitt. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you for that, Devitt. And so um, on that note, I think uh, the next thing we're about to do is to kind of play to our strengths and actually hear a story about um, social isolation and a pretty exciting project uh, to kind of overcome that and, and combat social isolation. So I'd like to introduce um, Carolyn Coombs from Southside Uniting Mount Gravatt. Oh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Carolyn, and I come from Southside Uniting Church at Mount Gravatt. Um, we've, for the last few years, been working on social isolation, and it started a number of years ago when we got a new minister, and uh, she went and met lots of people in the community and came back and said, we've got a problem with social isolation, and what are we going to do about it? Um, I'd have had some previous experience because I was an occupational therapist working in mental health and I'd set up some social activity groups previously. Um, and I knew the value of social connection of people coming together. So what we did was we started up a group on a Wednesday morning uh, that was held during term time and it was, we called it social activity groups for everyone, meaning we wanted it to be inclusive um, for males, females, uh, young, old, able-bodied, disabled, um, and children. Of course, that separated the working population because it was held on a weekday. Um, but in many ways, it has um, met its aim to make connections. Um, it's a free group where people can come without any cost. Um, and there are all sorts of little groups that happen. There is a chat group, an art group, a craft group, a sewing group, a table games group, mahjong group, someone does hooky rugs. Um, and we try and meet anyone's interest to allow them to start up a new group. And we're even offering tennis at the moment to see if anyone wants to join us. We had a small, uh, a library loan where we've got books that people can take for as long as they like and jigsaw puzzles that people can take for as long as they like and keep them if they want to, bring them back if they want to, bring others if they want to. Um, and for some people it's been wonderful where they've learnt skills and had their own projects to focus on. For others they've focused more outwardly and they have made fiddle blankets for dementia patients in aged care facilities, they've made um, knitted hats for newborn babies, they've made beanies for the Indigenous community, they've made um, library bags for children in Logan who couldn't bring library bags to school. Um, and so it's been a really lovely joining thing and people have been able to learn at their own pace but being in a group they've been able to connect and when COVID happened it was just really lovely to see people continuing to connect via phone and email with others and um, we kept an email group going and people would contact me as being one of the leaders and would say do you know of so-and-so who is sick do you know of this need uh, do you know so-and-so's husband died so it really did keep us all in touch with one another and um, we've been back a couple of weeks in person and we probably had a third of the people not coming because of their concerns still. And it looks a little different and we continue to socially distance. But um, I've had people who said, um, I, when you asked me, I had no idea that I was going to be the person most in need of this group. It's been amazing for me. Um, and so in our own small way, we are continuing to connect with people and people are asking other people. And I've certainly keep telling our little group of QCA and what it's doing. And I've asked people to 
um, log in and see what we're doing and maybe hear me. <laughs> so I think they'd be initially that would be their interest, but to actually see what community other community groups are um, are doing. So um, it's been wonderful also to see how the community has come on board. So not only is it people in the group that are telling their friends, uh, we're connected with um, Mount Gravatt Community Centre and we were part of the project to get the isolation workers um, involved. And we have now people that are coming uh, from National Disability Insurance Scheme. Some people are coming via psychological referral. Um, but often people are just hearing by word of mouth. Um, and we try to care for everybody that comes. The little ones have their own group. Um, and that's too, that's exciting too. And when COVID happened, uh, the carers and the children were able to meet in the park for a few weeks before we went uh, back, back together on site. Um, so it's been a small but quite effective linking activity in the community so that the community feel as though it's their group and um, and they have become involved in some of the um, outreach activities of the church such as a garage sale we have twice a year and we give half of that money away and probably half of the people who are volunteering are people that come to say so it's pretty exciting. Thank you so much Carolyn. Um, I think that's a really amazing story about how uh, kind of a community initiative has kind of turned into um, something that, you know, is being referred to um, by, you know, psychologists are referring people to um, this community group and, um, you know, community centres are also kind of relying on that community hub and then has, you know, kind of been there for people in this, in this time of crisis. So thank you so much, Carolyn, for your work and for sharing your story. Thanks. Um, and so stories and relationships are, are really important, but we also um, can't make policy decisions and policy demands without um, academic knowledge and people who spend um, a lot of time and energy thinking about and writing about and reading about um, particular ideas. And so I'd now like to invite Dr. Leah Sharman to um, talk to us for about 10 minutes on her research in social isolation. Hello, oh, can everybody hear me? Yes, I think so. Awesome. Uh, okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so hopefully everyone can see that, I'm not sure. I'm just going to steam ahead. Um, so um, before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge the traditional uh, custodians on the land on which I live and work, and also pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who uh, might be in a part of this Zoom call today. Um, so um, as Emily mentioned, my name is Dr. Leah Sharman. I'm from the University of Queensland School of Psychology and I'm currently working alongside the Mount Gravatt Community Centre and their Ways to Wellness program to evaluate how their loneliness intervention um, is working and how we can utilise it to reconnect people to the community through community organisations within Australia. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me is um, I have Fijian and Pacific Islander heritage and the importance of community has um, always been a large part of my life and upbringing. So I've always been interested in working to uplift communities because our relationships and connection to the community is really vital to the health, well-being, and functioning of everyone within it. Um, so my presentation is going to be quick today, hopefully, um, and will be a bit of background on loneliness and social isolation. Um, so I just wanted to also flag that I won't be um, necessarily on the Zoom call the whole time, um, but I just wanted to flag that my email address is at the bottom of this um, slide and it's also at the end of the presentation as well. Um, if you want to email me and ask any questions, I'm really open to, um, to answering anything or um, talking to anyone um, who's interested about anything as well. Um, yeah, so ooh, I can't get my thing to work. There we go. Um, so loneliness um, is commonly described as a painful emotional state resulting from a discrepancy in a person's current relationships and the ones that they desire to have and they wish to have. 
It is an aversive experience similar to some other states like depression and does share some features with depression as well as grief and homesickness. However, it is a distinct construct within itself. Um, so loneliness and social isolation are often discussed interchangeably and really um, we will discuss it interchangeably here today. But I also wanted to flag that loneliness is really distinct in itself um, compared to social isolation. Um, and while they're very much correlated with each other and interlinked, um, a person can um, have few social groups and be relatively socially isolated as we might think of them, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they actually feel lonely. And similarly, a person can be surrounded by others and have a lot of social connections, but still not really feel like those connections are meaningful and still also feel lonely. Um, so I just wanted to um, add that into the discussion as well. Um, so loneliness is generally precipitated by different life events that separate people from um, the social relationships that they have formed and that have been stable in their lives. Um, some common ones are leaving school, moving home, relationship breakdowns um, or bereavement, retirement as well. And of course, um, as we are all experiencing not so commonly a pandemic, um, so knowing some of these causes can really help to target where you would like to put resources into strategies for targeting loneliness as well and also help to better recognize when it might be happening to someone who is around you. Um, so loneliness has also been rising higher and higher on the political agenda for many years now. The US Surgeon General has warned of an epidemic of loneliness and the UK's relatively new Minister for Loneliness, which is kind of an exciting thought, has actually been rolling out a nationwide multi-agency loneliness strategy as well. So across the world, we've started to see governments and policy agendas looking to address and understand loneliness in the community. And in Australia, we've also started looking inward to understand how loneliness affects us. Um, so in the 2018 Australian Loneliness Report, um, they found that um, approximately half of respondents felt lonely in the past week. Um, nearly a third rarely felt they were a part of a group of friends and three quarters of those never or seldom felt that they had a neighbour who was available to talk to them. So importantly, the report revealed that loneliness afflicts people of all ages, genders and cultural backgrounds. Um, and interestingly, the highest number of uh, the highest uh, reported levels of loneliness were in the really like young adult group who you might tend to think is actually quite social and has a lot of um, connections and might not be lonely. But also those people um, generally tend to experience a lot of life transitions all around about the same age and time, leaving school, starting um, new jobs and leaving their families if they have to move, move towns or move cities. Um, so this is really important information um, because loneliness has serious consequences for individual health and well-being. I really apologize how blurry this picture is. Um, but the health effects of loneliness and social isolation have been documented in the literature for various health conditions, including depression, impaired cognitive health, car cardiovascular disease, increased blood pressure, um, and dementia as well. Both social isolation and loneliness are associated with increased mortality and some studies suggest that lacking social connections may have similar health consequences to smoking 15 cigarettes a day and may have worse health outcomes than risk factors like obesity and physical inactivity. So it's really important to note here that because of this quite significant health burden, there is a substantial economic impact of loneliness and social isolation as well. However, our attempts to combat loneliness have been hampered because over the years there have been really few attempts to um, understand loneliness, to measure it and to intervene in um, loneliness and social isolation when we see it in the community. Um, so when we have tried to address loneliness in the past, it has often been addressed as something that is a deficit. Um, when actually, so, uh, so for example, like a lack of social skills or a lack of opportunities for social contact, which in some cases is true, 
Um, but a lot of the time it's often some, not something that's missing, but it's about the extensive barriers that people face, which are social and structural that often prevent people from joining groups and making connections. So these are often unstable housing, employment, um, so unstable employment, which we're hearing a lot about at the moment anyway, um, as well as cognitions that might have formed around mistrust and stigma and feelings of being judged sort of the longer that a person is socially isolated as well. Um, so in fact, community organizations are actually excellent places to help with providing good onboarding strategies and diverse ways to help address these structural barriers. Um, and social prescribing is one of those ways. Um, I'm just going to really quickly flag this as <laughs> because I don't have a lot of time to talk about it in great detail, but it's sometimes referred to as um, non-medical prescribing or community referral. It's a relatively new concept and involves community members, GPs and allied healthcare professionals to refer people whose mental health is affected by loneliness or social exclusion to a range of community services that can um, help. So social prescribing really involves three components. One is referral into the program or self-referral into a social prescribing program. Consultation with a well-being worker, a community worker um, or coordinator who is within the community who can help them to address barriers um, that they might be experiencing. And then when they're ready to connect with a the group, um, their extensive knowledge about the local community will help them to link them with ex um, existing local community groups where that person will be interested in the activity at hand and hopefully spur some like-minded connections with their new groups. Um, that's quite a lot to it, um, but that's pretty much overall the gist. Um, so um, I'm just going to plug the Ways to Wellness program, which as Carolyn um, just mentioned, um, has this initiative also began because of the work of the local member from Mount Cravat and the Queensland Community Alliance. Um, and so the Ways to Wellness program is a free service um, that is at the Macrobat Community Centre and it's available to people in Macrobat and in the surrounding suburbs as well. Um, and they have people who are there to help help you with overcome any barriers to um, connecting with others and to um, assist you in like meeting new people and learning new skills if that's the kind of things that you need. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that out there as a plug as well, um, as it's a great um, social prescribing strategy. Um, and similar ones are popping up around Brisbane. Um, there's one that's just started um, at Acacia Ridge and one in Redland Bay as well. Um, so lastly, um, while we do have several different initiatives taking holds in different parts of Australia to address loneliness, um, federal and state policies have been really wide ranging on trying to address loneliness and social isolation and generally being relatively unclear and not really in lockstep. Um, this has led to a lot of initiatives that are short term, underfunded and under evaluated. And they really lead to pro problems for the future of not just the program's um, viability, which might be really wonderful programs, but they might only be funded for six months and then there's no more funding to keep going. Um, but also really leaves behind the people who will have relied on those services and started to use those services. Um, so what we really need is clear and connected policy across the state and federal governments and broad long-term funding that encompasses all of social policy because addressing loneliness is really um, a wide-ranging social issue. Um, and that's it for me. I just wanted to acknowledge all of the various people who are involved in all of the various projects. <laughs> Thank you. So now that we've heard um, you know, a bit about the problem of loneliness and social isolation and some of the ideas and research behind that from uh, Leah, I'm going to hand now to Roger Marshall and Elise Ganley um, to talk more about the solutions and the proposed policies um, that we have as the Alliance to fit into the Maroon Print. Yeah, thanks. I, I think I'm kicking off uh, Emily and good afternoon, oh, good evening everyone and uh, um, it's good to be here. Um, when Elisa asked me to, to, to do this with her, um, we thought that really there's a, a question of, I thought that I, I could give a perspective as, as a leader of the Alliance who's been around for a few years on 
where this issue sits and how it's grown as such a significant issue for for us as an alliance um and then take us into where we're uh, uh i suppose where we're at in terms of how we can as an alliance and alliance organizations and together we can do something about it um and try and um join that political scene that Devitt was talking about to to see things happen in the community both in the short term in the season of election and uh, in the longer term and both at a, a macro level of the um, political decision making level at government level but also at the grassroots level um, so i suppose in in the alliance i, I first saw it come up in an alliance issue uh, at one of the founding assemblies of the Mount Gravatt um, Alliance Group. Um, there's a, a lovely assembly there, and I know a number of people in this um, meeting tonight were, were there that evening, but we heard some powerful testimonies that night um, around the issue of isolation. Um, there, were, uh, there were stories of the isolation that people in the Mount Gravatt area had, had found as the suburban and urban landscape changed and where they used to have uh, many fewer neighbours in the past but they were very close to their neighbours and they, they, they were very connected to their neighbours now they've got more neighbours because there are big tower um, blocks next to them with units in them but they don't know any of the neighbours and never talk to anybody uh, there were stories of young people who had uh, found difficulty getting work and become unemployed and, and uh, long-term unemployed, um, never really found permanent jobs and finished up at home a great deal, uh, sort of locked into addictions to computer games and, and, and things of that kind. And there were stories of older couples um, who in their old age had... Uh, and were no longer able to get out into the community, no longer to go out of their homes and were living in really terrible conditions that were found by some of the pastors of the Southside Uniting Church. Um, really powerful stories and they resonated with me because I, I sort of recognised that this was a familiar story at the community centre at Logan East where I'm working um, and then we got involved in the, the the listening campaign in 2019 which we talked about before and the stories just came out of the woodwork and, and certainly we heard a lot at Lechner in my you know my patch from people who actually saw the community centre as, as something that had helped them a great deal because what we do at community centres is help people to connect into the community help people to make a contribution a good community centre is about helping people to make to come together to do things together and to make contributions to society and people talked about that but they also shared their stories of um similar kinds of things you know sort of long-term unemployment common issue uh retirement early retirement because you lose your job in your 50s and you're never going to get a job again and you suddenly find yourself at home people who do retire stories of you know are just waiting for the day people who went to turn to going and playing the pokies every day just so they've got somewhere to go and becoming addicted um, so those kinds of stories came out very strongly and as the listening went on the stories from um, not only urban communities like we face here in, we live in, in here in southeast queensland but we were hearing stories from um, from around Queensland through the Catholic social justice uh, groups and so on, where in rural and regional areas, isolation and loneliness are significant issues in, in those communities. We tend to think of them, those communities as being close together, but that's not the way people experience it a lot of the time uh, in those places. So there were lots and lots of stories coming through all the way through. So then, I was part of, so my awareness of that was really growing. Um, and I was part of the um, initial first round, I suppose, of the Researching for Action, which we do as part of our Alliance cycle. 
um, and you know the the relational organizing cycle and we talk to people we talk to leah's group we and we've heard leah so succinctly and we talked to pe people like that group and hearing that kind of evidence that leah gave us today but we heard it from a whole lot of um social thinkers and social researchers all saying the same story this is a growing issue around the world and in different parts of the world people are doing things things like the things that carolyn was talking about um, but in some parts of the world there's a lot more focus on coordinating this work and doing it at a, a more um, organized and structural level so we, we could hear those kinds of stories um, and i suppose the conclusion we came to at the end of that listening campaign was sure there are lots of things that organizations like the members of the alliance can be doing and during the covid i know uh Debit referred to work that's happened in mount Gravatt, and we've heard some of carolyn's stories but that's been happening in a number of different places i think most of the organizations the people's organizations that are part of the alliance have been doing that within their own organization and some of them have been able to go out into the wider community and do it as well the kinds of things that carolyn was doing I know here in the over 50s lifestyle village I live in, there's been a strong emphasis on checking up on, particularly on the people who are living on their own and the people who are infirmed uh, and looking after each other and the neighborliness. And the, the reports back we've been getting back at how strong and resilient the communities have been as a result of that. So we've got those things that we know we can all do. Um, I was just talking to the Reverend Esteban about some of the things that he's doing and the Reverend Mel about the things that she's doing in aged care homes and so on to hold people together. Um, so we know about those things, but we also know that this growing issue, and this one I think was the main thing that I picked up from the, the first round of action research, this growing issue that is this that's growing not only in our community but in commun Western communities around the world of loneliness and isolation and is really dampening putting a dampening effect on the well-being of our communities that it, it actually needs a whole of community response yeah it needs leadership from the top and things like that and that i suppose is where we're at now and i'm going to hand over to elise because she's got the answer on how we can how we can promote we can provoke that kind of whole of community response here in queensland and we can advocate for that that's right. So I guess the, the, just to be really clear, the Queensland Community Alliance as a collective will be advocating um, one on a parliamentary inquiry into social isolation, um, which is what we um, developed and, and signed off on at the discernment assembly. In the Maroon Print, we talk about a strategy, but in order to get to a strategy, we think we need a parliamentary inquiry. Things are worse since the pandemic happened. That's one. Two is we want to make sure that Ways to Wellness is fully funded um, at Mount Cravat. Um, and that will make sure that UQ has proper evidence in terms of what we should actually do. And um, they are able to thoroughly assess the link worker program and social prescribing um, and use the results elsewhere. Yeah, so um, they're, they're the two responses. Emily, did you want to go on to questions now? Yeah, so we've got a few minutes for maybe one or two questions. So if you've got any questions for uh, Elise, Roger or Leah, um, I'd invite you to put them in the chat now um, and then we're going to go back into small groups one last time uh, to kind of talk about next steps. No one's got any questions. All right. Well, like if I can just add something while people are thinking. Is that all right, Emily? Go for it. Cool. So I think um, part of the strategy of the inquiry, and we, we think a, a parliamentary inquiry is the best option, but if, if the parties were to suggest another version of a public inquiry, We'd, we'd be um, mm. happy with that. 
the idea is that it's a, a public inquiry that raises the profile of the issue. It raises the voices of the people experiencing it and the community leaders connected to them. And it raises the profile of the possible solutions. So like Leah was saying that there's a number of cutting edge things happening in different parts of Queensland. Um, so we want to, you know, we think the one that we're involved in with ways to wellness is, is, is very good, but there's also other important, mm. you know, and, and, um, cutting edge things happening. So the purpose of the inquiry is to take it from, a uh, uh, a, 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 a an issue that has some salience, but isn't at the top of people's agenda, um, and make it, make it something that has a much higher, um, profile in media and in government and therefore you get the strong strategy off the back of it a strategy that can can be a much bigger and longer term thing um, so it needs to do those three things raise the importance of the issue raise the voices of the people who are experiencing it and raise the profile of the of the possible solutions Cool, thank you. Um, so I'm going to invite questions again one more time. Um, I am just now putting you into breakout rooms. Again, Sandra, you've raised your hand. Um, do you want to just ask your question out loud? Um, I just don't quite understand what a um, parliamentary inquiry is. So, um, do you have any recent examples of one that we ones that we might all be aware of? Because, I mean, to me, it seems to be a little bit um, kind of back to front. I would have thought a parliamentary inquiry happens when there's a lot of community um, concern about a particular issue, where it seems that we're trying to create community concern by having a parliamentary inquiry. Yeah, oh it's, yeah, it's a good question, Sandra. I think the problem is there is lots of concern and that, that it is happening. You know, people have been talking a lot about, you know, particularly in the, in the pandemic, you know, people that are really socially isolated at the moment and concerns around that. Um, I think there is, I mean, yeah, I, I think there is enough community concern in that sense. The problem is it's not well, there's no organisation of those resources. Um, there's no organised kind of um, community response. There's no, or, or government response. And so part of it is just building on the work that's being done and, and finding a, a strategy from there. Um, in terms of parliamentary inquiries that have been done and effective to that effect, Devitt, do you know any off the top of your head? Yeah, so there's two that we've been involved in in the last few years in, in Queensland. So, um well, three, three. So, yeah. but the two that fit this kind of strategy. So, one, those of you who are at our founding assembly might remember the story of, of that Sergio shared about being a cleaner um, and um, you know the wage theft that was that he was experiencing. So, there was a parliamentary inquiry into labour hire practices, which was basically what allowed that wage theft to happen, and that. In, it's similar because it was clear that there was a problem. It wasn't clear what the best solution was. And so um, the, the parliamentary inquiry gave a, a process that worked for translating it into government action. Um, and so the wage, um, the, sorry, the labour hire licensing arrangement that we've then campaigned in support of um, was, was introduced. And so that's something that, that you know, is benefiting the community now. Similarly, um, around wage theft, the same the same process has happened, and that's now seen. Um, like at, at the time of the last state election, there was not clarity of what was the best path forward on that. Whereas um, it provided an opportunity for us to share stories of people like Luz, who's a Colombian international student, or. Um, um, Palani, who's a, an Indian community leader, um, and so on, um, to, to come and share stories about their, the impacts for their communities. And that's, that's seen a change to wage theft laws in Queensland. Um, so I guess that's, that's kind of what we're, we're going for is replicating that. There might not be, um, 
they might not be well publicly known, <laughs> but they are things that our alliance has engaged with and that have had the desired impact. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. And hopefully we'll see you same time next week um, for our session on community centre funding.